and it is seven o'clock. So my name is Gail McConnell. I'm the president of the Pines and Prairies chapter of the Native Plant Society of Texas. And this is our February monthly chapter meeting. Um, because of the large Zoom audience that we have, um, we will um, have our business meeting at the end of the presentation and the question and answer session. Um, Pines and Prairies chapters, please, members, please stay on to the end. We do have um, officers to elect or board of directors to elect and um, a presentation of longevity pins. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our director at large, Mike McGee. Okay. All right. Yeah. Minimize which one? This one? Just at the top of it, the little one bar at the top of your side window. That side window on the right. That there you go. There you go. There. All right. All right. So the uh, this presentation is adapted for one that I developed for training for our Hartwood uh, uh, chapter of Master Naturalist, and the title is the name for a uh, kind of a joint program that we're getting a slow start, but we're getting it going. That was between the Hartwood chapter and the Pines and Prairies chapter. So um, I know I'm speaking to the choir tonight. Well, hopefully you'll find some things that are interesting, uh, maybe new and useful to you. And uh, if you have any questions, raise your hands. If you're remote, uh, put your question in the chat and I'll try to answer them as I go along. And uh, just a second. It's on. We discovered one through the joint hours. Okay. Now, Jim? Okay. Yeah, but it got up in the cabinet. Just a second. But... The problem is that I've got anything to do with it. No. Um, so, no, you gonna you want me to? Yes. You just say yes. next. Okay. So, okay. Uh, as you're looking and contemplating this picture of Earth uh, taken from space, I want to quote uh, uh, from Adelaide Stevenson uh, an address he made to UN in uh, 1965. We traveled together, passengers on a little spaceship, dependent on its vulnerable reserves air and soil, all committed for our safety, for security and peace, preserved from annihilation only by the care, the work, and I will say, the love we give our fragile craft. So without introduction, uh, one of the things that's important to understanding why natives are so vital is the element of time. It's hard to get our hit hands uh, head around that. So I'm gonna do a visual, uh, I'll describe it as well. So, if you imagine that the stretch of my hand is the age of your four and a half billion years. So, when do you think first complex life occurred? Okay, that's trilobite. So, the answer is on my right wrist. So, about 500 million years ago, that's when first complex life appeared. And all the rest of the ball since then in the uh, uh, distance of my hand. Man, on the other hand, our entire history of our species can be removed by a single scrape of a fingernail file on my right index. So we're absolute Johnny Come Lately evolutionary party. But not our I'm sorry. Mike. I'm sorry, this is Gail. Yeah. Can you hold the mic up to your mouth because it's um, coming out a little muffled? Okay, is that better? Um, no, not really. 
<laughs> is that better? Better. Okay. Is there a volume that you can turn up? No. Try again. Talk is that any better? Carolyn is clear. We can't hear anything at all now, and I'm getting um, comments in the chat. Hey, everyone, if you could hang on for just a minute, they're working on it. That's the Any better? Yep, we can hear you now. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay, so the population grew steadily, basically, up to this inflection point. And that inflection point is around the 1700s. That's the Industrial Revolution. And from there, it just uh, went up extremely rapidly to its present um, um, level. Uh, in my lifetime, Earth's population has tripled. U.S. population has Can you doubled. Again? She, I'm and, sorry. She's saying the sound's really muffled again. I think it's getting the right way. You may is that you better? set it on the table like we did before. Is that better, Mail? Uh, because they do uh, I can't. You're, you're rather... Um, muffled or muted and uh, Carolyn is very clear. So perhaps if you could stand at the podium. All right, I'll do that. Okay, and what I'm gonna do is- Is that okay? Not Mike, I can't, um, Carolyn's clear, not you. Okay, but Mike's right here now. Go ahead, Mike. All right, is that better? Yes. Okay, okay. so it's picking up this mic. It's, yeah, it's picking up that mic. Oh, that is that any better? Yes, yeah. much better. Okay. okay, okay, okay. We figured it out. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm gonna run. Um, so that's a lot of ma mouths to feed, and one of the things that uh, this slide shows is uh, percentage of pasture land and percentage in in green and percent uh, crop land in orange. And the gist of it is, is basically we've converted half of all arable land just to feeding human beings. Okay, next slide. Really? No, I got it. Okay, all right, so. Uh, We'll get a slide without a problem on it. Yeah. Okay. So this shows the pie chart of land use in the um, in the lower forty eight states and then ninety in the United States. And the big three are forest land, grassland, which is 
um, and then cropland. And together they make almost 90%. The next uh, largest is actually urban land. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And uh, next to that, less, just under 6% is parks and preserves. That's all parks and preserves. I want to give you some context for that. There's a, a UN Convention on Biological Diversity, and you, you may remember the Rio Summit, the Earth Day, you know, summit that uh, uh, from many years ago. Well, an offshoot of that was this Convention on Biodiversity. 150 um, countries have joined uh um, that UN convention. Fortunately, the United States is not one of them. But there are what they call a, a Ichi targets, and they studied uh, biodiversity and they established well, what, how much of our terrestrial land should be protected and preserved to be able to maintain biodiversity? And that's the target they set of 17%. There are nine countries that have exceeded it. France is one of those. There are 40 countries that have met it. So our neighbors to the north and south, Mexico and Canada have met it. UK have met it. China has met it. India has met it. Um, so we're well below the level necessary uh, to maintain biologic diversity according to the IHE targets. Okay, next slide. Um, this is a lot of detail and only talk about two things here. This is actually uh, more detail on how we use land. The point I want to make is that the, the biggest single uh, use is for livestock. 41% of all the lower 48 land goes into uh, either pasture land for livestock and all forms of livestock sheep, goats, horses, and also feed for those same livestock. Urban area is also a surprisingly large um, amount. And every year we're losing a million acres of land to um, urbanized area. And to give you a feel for that, that's the equivalent to Los Angeles, Houston, and Phoenix combined every year that is growing urbanized. So Next slide. Um, okay, so I need to introduce what this is going to be. I'm going to show you um, data from census um, um, reports from 1960 to a forecast of 2030. And what you need to pay attention to is those warm colors, the bottom, what looks like maroon, at least on my screen, the greater than 128. That's a, a, a city density. Uh, the next one, the orange, that's like a suburb density. And the yellow is exurbs. So now we'll just show how it's changed. So as you can see, the forecast uh, by 2030, most of the land east of the Mississippi River is some type of urbanization, whether you know it's a dense city or all the way to an exurb. Okay, so next slide. Texas land is a little different than the United States. Uh, we have a lots of grassland. Um, it's two thirds next cropland. Forest land is next. Um, Urban is about the same as the U.S., a little bit less, 5.7, and 3.4% is uh, parks and preserves. Uh, and that's about average for the United States of how much, at least how much land is in state parks and national parks. We rank 28th, so we're kind of in the middle. Yeah. So the grassland would include like a Chihuahuan desert? Yes, yes. So, so it's, it's sort of a... Yeah, it's... it's a, it, uh, they call, they call that range land. So I've put uh, range land and uh, grassland into a single thing, and it and that's what a lot of Texas is. If you right. you dr drive west Texas, you use miles and miles of. <laughs> so um, and the other thing that's remarkable about Texas is 
we have a very high percent uh, private ownership. 95% of the land is owned privately in the state of Texas. So next slide. Um, Thank you, Dad. There we go. Okay, so um, this is getting a little closer to home. In fact, uh, to my home, this is exactly centered over it. So this is uh, South Montgomery, North Harris County. If you look at the, you see the river that goes through there, that's Spring Creek. So it's Harris South, uh, uh, Montgomery County North. It's centered on my home. Uh, and this is what's happened between 2002 and 2019. So we've gone from a largely, you know, forested canopy in 2002. Now that that is an old growth forest that was uh, actively logged. A lot of that land was logged till now, you know, most of it's been urbanized. Uh, and if we're not for the, the, uh, the Spring Creek Greenway project, a good part of that along the Greenway would probably be urbanized as well. All right, so that's, okay, next slide. So what's the consequence of that? Why does that matter? There's something called the species uh, area relationship in ecology. This is a well-established rule that says the number of species supported equals some constant times the area of habitat to log to raise to a power. Okay, so that's the species area relationship. And the next slide to show you example of that. So this is fresh fi uh, fish species uh, plotted on a log. Uh, plot with area versus number of species. And it's largely a, a straight line that shows that, you know, the continents, yeah, question. Area of what? The area of, of habitat available for those species. Undisturbed. Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, I didn't see you in the chat that when you have a question from earlier, would you repeat the question? Because oh. you're, they're hearing you better than the room. Okay, so the question is, what, uh, area of what and it's the area of habitat for species okay so if it's a monoculture of grass it's doesn't count okay why is why is the area of Hawaii different? Or is it shoreline or is it well it's just okay this is the yeah this is okay so these are areas of the continents and so that supports tens of thousand and this is the area of the island is just very small. So it's only gonna support you know, less than 10 species. And there's a practical example on the next slide. So when we built the uh, Panama Canal in uh, 1914, they uh, created a dam to run the locks. And when they did that, what was a mountaintop became a, an island and from its inception, that island is a, a biological research area and is to this day. So what happened, you know, with this localized, you know, now area is extinction, localized extinction. 50 to 80 non-migratory birds went extinct on the island. 8% of the butterflies went extinct on the island. All three of the cat species went locally extinct. Okay, so next slide. So the U.S., our um, conservation strategy is termed nature reservation. So we've, we've created reserves uh, um, for nature, you know, to prevent development and, and to allow nature to uh, be preserved inside the, those areas. That started with our national parks, uh, first one in 1872, state parks, we had a Wilderness Act in 1964, and then the yeah. Endangered Species Act uh, in 1973. And depending on how you look at it, it either does a really good job or not so good job, because it once on, most of the species haven't gotten off, all right? Only 54 have got delisted. Bald eagle's a good example. Humpback whale will be another example. But not many have gone extinct either. Only 26 have gone extinct that weren't extinct when they were first listed. Or, and this is either have gone extinct or are likely extinct. And that means they haven't been seen in nature for 10 years. 
Another important act uh, is the IRS conservation easement tax in 1980, which was really key for a lot of the conservancies uh, that I know a number of our members are uh, active in. Uh, next slide. So there's limits with that uh, nature um, reservation strategy. First of all, there's just insufficient area. Mm -hmm. uh, to preserve the species uh, from the things I've already talked about. It, it's very fragmented, which is a problem for, uh, for uh, uh, maintaining species. They're very limited arable land. Um, and if you look at the outcomes of what's going to happen with that little land of species extinction, it's really quite um, alarming. So next slide. There, this is just a couple of um, studies looked at what's happened with the populations. This is a study done by the um, London Zoological Society and the World uh, Wildlife Federation jointly. Yes, so they, they were able to get 4,300 vertebrate species data that they could go back to 1970. So like the, the Christmas bird count was one of the things that they were using data on. So they tracked, okay, what has happened with populations of these 4,300, 4,400 species since 1970? And the conclusion is that globally, we've lost, uh, we've had a 68% decline in the number of, uh, spe of these species since 1970. Uh, quite remarkable. And then North America, they, and in fact, each of the continent air, continental areas, they looked at what's the cause for that. And so if you'll hit the next clicker, the biggest cause is land use, you know, loss, you know, loss of habitat, over exploitation. And then sort of surprisingly, climate change is way down at the bottom of the list. Now we're early days in climate change, but it's only thought to be cause for about 5% of the decline in North America. And another study on the next slide looked at bird populations. Uh, same period, actually, uh, from 1970 onwards, and they found about a 3 billion bird population decline since 1970. And on your right, you won't be able to really see this. I apologize for that. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of the data and a little bit of the background on that. The biggest decline is in grassland birds, it's like 53%, and some 75% of the species are experienced, experiencing a decline in the grassland. The really positive news in this is what's happened in the wetlands. That's the only biome that hasn't declined. In fact, it's gone up 13%. And it's gone up because of uh, a tremendous amount of investment and energy into restoring wetlands and uh, bird habitat. And uh, some of it was uh, game management, but uh, not all that was government. In fact, a lot of it was privately. Ducks Unlimited, since 1937 alone have, have preserved and conserved 13 million acres of habitat. Really remarkable. And a good example of what we can do, I think. So next slide. So what's the consequences of losing species out of an ecosystem? The, the explanation that is most commonly used now is that it's like Jenga puzzle. You're starting taking things out. And as you start taking it out, it becomes less stable. And there's a point at which it'll collapse. Um, there is an example of that, uh, Easter Island that was man-made. Uh, this is a couple hundred years ago, there was a man-made cause that they lost, the, they, their ecosystem collapsed. But the real issue, I think, isn't that all our ecosystems are going to collapse. It's more that it degrades the functions of those ecosystems and how well they perform. So the next slide is that um, the, we, we're largely a uh, urbanized so uh, society. And we need healthy um, ecosystems functioning for us. And this is a list, I won't read them to you. Sarb carbon sequestration, uh, removing pollutants, 
aquifer recharge, controlling floods. These are all essential services that we need uh, uh, for our um, urbanized society. So that all is pretty academic sounding. So next slide. But here's an example. What does that mean in practice when we degrade our ecosystem? So let's we all know about Hurricane Harvey. You know, billions of dollars in uh, property damage. I've seen 80 to over two, uh, 200 deaths. But the study was made of this by this Antonio Sebastian and, and group, basically, is a, uh, where they did a, built hydrological models of the, bay, of the Houston area and then tested it versus historical data uh, pre, kind of pre-development. So they calibrated that. Then they used their model to look at what happened in Hurricane Ar Harvey and said, well, what would have happened if we had not done anything to our ecosystems and you know, how much worse did we make it by degrading our uh, ecosystems? So um, I use this from uh, where we were using it in a class. So the answer is 85%, almost twice as bad as it would have been uh, otherwise. And the way that that's made up is 15% uh, is due to climate change. Okay. that. Um, there's a number of studies, um, and this one thought that they could very conservatively um, for, um, forecast that it was made about, there's about 15% more rainfall than there would have been if, um, yeah, excuse me, uh, would have, um, 15% more rainfall than would have been without climate change. The big factor was the peak flood rate. It's 50% higher due to urbanization. So we took out a lot of the natural things, um, you know, prairies and prairie plants and bayous and things that, that will absorb and help buffer runoff, replaced it with a bunch of impervious services, and then put in a few uh, uh, containment measures to try to hold back this flood the, the, and contain those floods, but this is net of those. It's 50% worse than, more than 50% worse than what it had been undeveloped. So, you know, degradation of this, these services have real consequences. Um, I'll just hit, go through this real quickly. Uh, the World Economic Forum every year does a survey in short-term near-term and long-term, long-term to call it 10 years. And the reason I think this is significant is it's a thousand people that are surveyed that are, the, these are not environmentalists. They're from business, from academia, uh, from government uh, leaders, uh, and they're assessing what are the risks to our global economy. Guess what? The top three are all environmental from their survey. Climate action failure is number one. Number three is biodiversity loss. They see is the biggest next 10 years risk. Okay, so next slide. So our, our past strategy has been kind of a, what I call sparing, you know, that let's, let's make these reserves. The current thinking is we need to, do, we need to approach it differently. We have always got this um, tension between economic growth, jobs, those are real needs, and the environment. There's always this constant tension. And the idea is that we need to really stop that. We really need to try to do both at the same time. We need, and, that, and that's what so-called sharing. So uh, native habitats to conserve species diversity in the places we live, work, or play. And I cannot think of a better example of that strategy than native plants in our yards. I mean, it's perfect. That's exactly what we're doing. So why do we need plants? Well, of course we need them for oxygen. If we didn't have plants, we wouldn't have oxygen to breathe. That's how we convert the sun's energy into food. But importantly, the only native plants support ecosystems. Non-native plants do nothing for the ecosystems. 
and only native plants support a living earth. So next slide. And this is back to this co-evolution. So the over millions of years, plants have developed defenses against their predators, the insects, and the herbivores. And some of those are physical defenses, and, and many of them are, they produce secondary biologi uh, biological chemicals that are toxins. But with adap adaptation, some insects learn how they can use and overcome those toxins, and in fact, use them in some cases, like the monarch, for their own defense. So this, this millions of years of adaptations and evolution has, has led to ec um, ecosystems that are highly integrated. And if you bring a non-native plant and bring it into your yard, it's not recognized as food. 90% of uh, plant-eating insects are specialists. They only eat plants that they've co-evolved with and they know they have the ability to consume. Native plants produce 35 times the caterpillar mass lar from insect larvae as from uh, non-native plants. And that is what our birds feed their young. So next slide. First, most people are familiar with Doug Tallamy and his work. And uh, so I've seen, I've heard this almost every presentation I've been to about native plants, but I'll repeat it here that how many insects does it take to feed this fledge of Carolina chickadees from the time they hatch to the time that they fledge? Well, his re research is six to 9,000 uh, insects and mainly insect larvae and that is coming from native plants. If what's surrounding that nest is all uh, non-native plants, there's no food, all right? There's no food to, to uh, raise their young. So the population of birds in particular it, um, is dependent upon how many native plants are in their area. So next slide. So can one yard make a difference? This is another Doug Tallamy um, saving nature example. It's a yard in uh, Chicago. It's right next to O'Hare Field, uh, a 10th of an acre. So Pam Carlson, this is her yard. She's lived there for 25 years. She's put 70 uh, native plants in her yard over that period. She's observed 103 bird species in her yard, and many of them are raising their young either in her yard or adjacent to it. So can one yard make a bit difference? You betcha, it really can. Okay, so next slide. Now this one, you're gonna have to tap a lot of times. So, so this is, uh, I like to take photographs of nature as a lot of people do, but basically the point I, I wanna make is that the more natives you have in your yard, the greater diversity and number of uh, wildlife you're going to attract. And uh, so you not only in the case of butterflies, I'm going to show some butterflies in a little bit for, we got a few people here that I know are interested in this, um, that uh, um, not only have to have nectar plants, but you all have to have the host plants. So you got to feed the adults, but you all also got to have something for the, them to rear their young on in or near your yard. So the next slides, um, one of my favorites is a chrome, um, fragrant mist flower. And over a two week period, I decided uh, how many species of butterfly am I gonna see? So just keep flipping through there. So I'll give you the answer. It's 20, 20 species of butterfly. I'm, I've seen others in my yard. I just didn't see them on my uh, fragrant mist flower. But that's the point. The more natives you have, the more diversity of natives you have, the more wildlife you're going to have in your yard and the more enjoyment you will get from that. So um, we're getting also, near the end. The record, record holder plant down at the National Butterfly Center. Oh, really? Yeah. I think they have over 60. Yeah, why don't you, why don't you repeat that, Don? Uh, the, the National Butterfly Center in Mission, Texas. Yeah. Uh, they have over 60 native plants. 
Uh, it's a little 100 acre spot down there where they grow plants for butterflies, native plants, and they've had over 60 uh, on that particular plant that Mike was showing. Oh, the, uh, on the yeah, flower. Yeah, Chromalina odorata. So not all plants are equal in their ability to host caterpillars. Uh, there's um, a website for the National Wildlife Foundation um, that you can put in your location and it'll show you what are the genera of plants that produce the most um, butterfly, um, bo most host the most caterpillars in your area. So across almost any location, number one is Quercus. All right, so the oaks are number one. Prunus to, and in our area of the perennial flowering plants are the goldenrods. They host the most, sort, and then uh, then the sunflower. So if you're going to plant just a few, make them the keystone plants. So what are the environmental benefits uh, of natives? Well, number one is better carbon ca capture. Uh, they're much better than non-natives for many reasons. One is they last longer, okay? So they, they're, they're gonna survive and live longer. And in the grasses, they have much longer roots. So you have a lot of biomass that's down below the soil. Um, and there is some recent research that says that, and this kind of ties to Terry's talk last week and Bob's uh, the, uh, Daly's talk previously, is that um, the, this research looked at um, non-native um, native plants and then introdu introduction of non-native plants and non-native plant colonies and how quickly did they give up their CO2? And so the summary was that the non-natives were giving up CO2 two and a half times as fast as the native colonies. And they think the reason for that is all underground. It's that it, um, it's the whole soil biology and its interrelationship with invertebrates that is keeping the carbon essential effectively sequestered longer. Um, better aquifer recharge because of the longer roots, uh, reduced runoff for the same reason, and improved water quality, particularly from uh, uh, wetlands and uh, purpose-built like bioswales. You get a lot of removal of pollutants, uh, both sediment and actual um, hydrocarbons from um, native plants. Okay, next slide. So what are the other benefits? Lower maintenance. Um, you don't, re we don't require, uh, you know, biological, or uh, we don't require uh, insecticides. In fact, you don't want insecticides. You have biological pest control. You don't need fun fungicides for native plants. And you have much better survivability because they're adapted for the environment. Um, water conservation in general, much lower water needs because again, adapted for the environment. Now in droughts, uh, yeah, you may need to, to, to water your native plants, but not to the extent that you will non-natives. And I think another big reason is just how much you can enjoy your yard. Now to me, this is a really big deal because it's all, it's not just the flora, it's all the fauna that they bring with it and all the life that you've got in your garden. No comparison in my mind. And also just a sense of place and time. You know, you're in uh, a native uh, garden is in harmony with the environment that the house is placed in. And it, look, it fits, right? It fits it there and it changes with the season. You know, we don't, you know, we have winters are not as severe as other places, but it fits the season. Next slide. Um, we don't have um, New England fall color, although we have some natives that have some really nice fall color, but we have lots of plants that bring color in the fall in, uh, in our ecosystems here. And uh, they're really quite remarkable. So next slide. Okay, so so I started off with this program, Saving Nature, and 
I think that's a pretty tough uh, goal for any program or organization or individual. Nobody can save nature, but there's one heck of a lot we can each do. And if we all do that, we can make a big difference. So some suggestions for that are on the next slide and go ahead and be a good example. I think that's really important. People, um, a lot of people, and I started out gardening by doing this. I used to drive through River Oaks and I thought that's what they should look. I mean, if this is, you have all the money you want and that's what your garden looks like. That's what I should do too, right? So be a good example, have natives, have a good looking native garden and people will try, want to emulate that. Education of the public, I think, is important, and education of ourselves, right? So we can be good messengers with our neighbors and friends. Uh, support plant sales. I think our chapter really, for a young chapter, has done an outstanding job. And uh, a person that shares that is here. So um, if you want to support that, there is always need for more volunteers. Uh, help increase retail supply. This is a huge problem. You go out to the, nur the retail nurseries and you find not enough, not nearly enough natives. Uh, Carol Childress, I don't know if she's on the uh, line or not, but she, I, don't, I can't think of anybody better suited to head that um, effort. And she has taken it over and I'm sure she could would welcome your help. So for Pines and Prairies folks, um, that's a very worthwhile way. Uh, share natives with your neighbors. I think that's another good idea. Engage with your community, whether that's your HOA or your church to encourage you know, um, native gardening and maybe even uh, lead that. We've got a member of our uh, chapter who is converting their, uh, taking out the invasives and converting their church uh, garden to, uh, to a native garden. And uh, really just an excellent example. There are a lot of conservation groups you can join and citizen science. Uh, a lot of this data comes from citizen science and that's kind of a plug for next month. Alicia Mine Johnson will be here and she'll be teaching us about how to use iNaturalist and how to uh, uh, participate in a bio blitz uh, that's coming up in April. So that's kind of my, that's it. So if there's any other questions that are on, okay. Carol is on the line. Okay, good. All right, good. All right, so I think with that, we are now ready to turn it back over to our business meeting. Um, Mike, actually there was one um, question early on asking whether the grassland category includes rangeland. I posted that in there. That's what he had asked. And someone said they couldn't hear the question. The answer is yes. But we do have questions coming in. So stand by. Could we see the 2030 slide about population again? Oh, the, the overhead aerial picture in my house. And the, the yeah, population population growth, uh, over the course over the United States. Oh, yeah. 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. Well, in 2030, yeah. the whole East Coast is urbanized. It's exponential growth. Mm -hmm. And if you pass by it, also the Keystone plants slide, which we already passed them up. Yeah, so this is it, but it's the last one in that. You know, you know, you're going to to that if you hit start it. Okay. And then the Keystone Plants list. Also, we want your email. <laughs> okay, and it's on the front slide. So this will be, we'll put this, all of our chapter meetings go on the, um, um, the, the chapter YouTube. And uh, my email is in the front. It's mcgee at sbcglobal.net. So, and if anybody would like uh, a PDF copy of this, I'll, okay. I'll send you one.
because you can put in your zip code and it'll pull up your key candidates. Yes. What, what website is that? National Wildlife Foundation. Yeah, it's basically taking research, mainly, I think, from Doug Tallamy and, and the, his, graduate his graduate students, right. So I kind of put him as the umbrella for, yeah, and a lot of, yeah. And one other question remaining, what did we do about ants in the garden? Oh, they're part of the system. Well, you know, if they if they if they are, I I make exceptions for invasives. So um, a very satisfying method is boiling water. You can hear it. You can't hear them, but you can imagine it. <laughs> I have one of those. Yeah. And what's the best way to find groups in this area? And I can guess maybe they mean like-minded people groups. Native Plant Society of Texas, look it up online. Yeah. Heartwood uh, uh, Naturalist, also a great resource. So, who, who asked that? Was that somebody from here? So, because we have people from all over the state. Mm -hmm. Lorena. Oh. So, Lorena, are you nearby? Here. Okay. So the question for you, Lorena, is if you live in, in this area, so that Pines and Prairies is your local chapter? If it is, then you definitely need to join the chapter. And if you'd like to learn more, you can join the Hartwood Texas Master Naturalist, but our next classes don't start till next, till 2024. And the NIPSOT and Texas Master Naturalist have maps where you can find a chapter in your area. Yes, right. yes. And Google the state organization. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. State organizations for the chapter nearest you. Lorena's out on this. Good. A lot of thank yous. Appreciate it. Um, also, another tip for ants: we use orange oil and dish soap. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so many fun ways. Is it screen? Because it's green. It's so cool. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. So, All right. Yeah, so stay online if you are a, a Pines and Prairies member so you can vote, correct? Right. Okay. Right. Please stay online if you're Pines and Prairies. And if you'd like to um, listen yeah. in to our business meeting, which is going to be about 10 minutes long, you're okay. very welcome to stay on. Um, first, I'd like to um, ask Don Dubois. Du Bois to um, have the longevity pins out. Um, did Amber make it to the meeting? I don't think Amber? so. Okay. Um, so I couldn't we pronounce the last name anyway. I'm sorry? <laughs> yes. So, so I'm having a hard time with the last name, but I, I made an approximation. Okay. Well, um, we do have um, our 30 plus year member, Rick Easton, in the room. And Rick has uh, been awarded, I hope, all of your pins, Rick. Um, but we really, really appreciate your longevity with the Native Plant Society of Texas. And this is the pin. It has a passion flower on it. And the script says something about wildflowers are my passion or something like that or oh, passion long time passion it's something about passion flowers it's very appropriate <laughs> <laughs> thank you rick thanks for being here at the meeting um our next and uh, let me just say that um the five-year pins were going to terry MacArthur and amber h um and 25-year pins to doug boyd and pam hunkin and I just want to give Doug a shout out, because, shout out because he is a professor at Lone Star College in Tomball and has planted and is maintaining a native plant garden there. And um, if anyone else has a public garden that they started and, are, and or are maintaining, please email the Pines and Prairies um, chapter so um, and let us know that you're doing that and send some photos so that we can put you on our member initiative page on our website. Um, the main order of business tonight is uh, the election of officers. 
Um, we have Vice President Martin Simonton uh, for Treasurer April Smith and Directors at Large Abby Inse Hendrickson and David Lemons. And April Smith, you did not meet last week. Um, April, if you want to come forward and introduce yourself to the membership. Hi, um, my name is April Smith. Um, I've been gardening with native plants for about four or five years. Uh, transformed my garden to mostly natives. Um, monarch waste station and a um, certified wildlife um, habitat. Thank you. And then I've been a member of Plants and Prairies for about two year, two years. Um, also good with spreadsheets and budget planning. So. Hi. <laughs> Thanks, April. And um, Abby, I don't know if Abby's online. I don't think so. Abby has been a director at large for Pines and Prairies since the inception of the chapter and is standing for re-election for another two-year term. She's out in the woods camping tonight. Um, last chapter meeting, it was her birthday. So um, you can see she keeps herself quite busy. She also owns a, a native landscaping um, company called Living Wild. And uh, so she's, I'm sure, doing taking some time before the big spring season starts up. So this is a slate of um, officers and directors that we accepted. Um, Carson Stokes, thanks very much again for being the nominating chair for the Pines and Prairies. And if I could um, have a vote, those of you online, if you would um, go down to the bottom of your screen to reactions and click on that and uh, put a green check or raise your hand one or the other. The others, those of you who are in person tonight, please say aye um, if you agree um, to vote for this slate of candidates. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none opposed, um, congratulations to uh, Martin, April, Abby, and David Lemons. Thanks for serving. It's uh, been such a pleasure to work with you all and um, I can you know it's it takes many hands to have a chapter grow so quickly and to have all the activities that we do and I can't thank you enough it's um, just really really been fun for me and uh, a great learning experience. Um, Mike said something in his talk about education of the public, and I want to invite you to sign up um, to, uh, to reach the public at the Montgomery County Home and Outdoor Show. It's March 4th and 5th. The hours are long. It goes from 9 to 5. Um, Patty Thompson, our outreach chairperson, um, has done most of uh, is it is often there the whole time um, and she needs a few breaks. So if you can help that weekend, please sign up. I sent it, uh, the link to you um, in an email or later, uh, earlier th this afternoon. All right, is there any other business that anyone wants to bring forward? Um, all right, then we'll end just a bit early, but I thank you all for being here. It's um, always fun to see everyone and to chat. So um, let's say good night and thanks for being here. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank you.